So uh, our fourth panel, um, and we're looking at papers broadly addressing sort of spaces. So we've entitled this Contesting Spaces, and it's under the umbrella of Mapping Europe. Um, so I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Bruno, uh, who is Senior Lecturer in Cultural Studies and French Studies at Roehampton. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for coming. So, navigating identities in the post-colonial banlieue, the case of two femme de ménage writers. This paper analyzes a couple of texts written by two women cleaners living in the infamous 4000 estate in La Courneuve near Paris. Identified during ethnographic research where I established an archive of resources on the troubled estate, Franco-Tunisian Aya Rochelle's text, 1985-1987, and Guadeloupe-born Thérèse Bernis autobiography, Paris, Souvenir Encombrant de la Guadeloupe, Paris, Troublesome Memories of the Guadeloupe, are at the center of my analysis. This presentation will suggest that the use of Stuart Hall's multiple identities to analyze this text can help not only to de-essentialize dominant representations of a banlieue as a national threat, but more importantly, unveil how femme de ménage writers from the Maghreb and Caribbean negotiate identities in post-colonial France. For several decades now, France has been faced with a growing crisis, one which has been attributed to the banlieue and the settling of immigrants from its former colonies, such as the Maghreb and the West Indies. The state of moral panic induced by the banlieue can clearly be felt when it comes to the area described in the writings studied in this paper. La Courneuve's 4000. This estate or cité has often been compared by journalists, politicians and experts to a no-go area. Affected by profound social and economic problems, the infamous 4000 which derives its name from the number of flats built in the 1960s, is situated seven miles no to the northeast of Paris, yet is far removed from the capital's centers of political, economic, and cultural power. Indeed, over the years, La Courneuve has witnessed incidents of physical violence of different degrees, muggings, assassinations, riots, and terrorism. Furthermore, it is generally considered in France and beyond to have contributed in part to the 2005 riots when, during the course of a visit to the Cité, former Home Secretary Nicolas Sarkozy controversially advocated the use of Kercher, pressure washer, to clean up the racaille, the scum, a remark which remained engraved in the memory of those who live in the banlieue and elsewhere. While the stigmatized and disadvantaged banlieue have been culturally classified primarily as an oral space, perpetuating the periphery as a place of non-writing or sub-writing, local writers in their work provide a fresh outlook on the realities and myths that permeate the rhetoric. And this is what both Aya Rochelle and Thérèse Bernis, also known as Paris, do. Rochelle and Bernis are interesting on a number of levels. Though their origin, through their origin, they foreground the complex identity intersections which come together in the 4000. Although we don't get much in the way of context, we do glean that Aya is around 30, 35, Tunisian Jewish, and writes a series of short, fragmentary texts in the mid 1980s as part of a project entitled. Civilisation de la Courneuve, image brisée d'une cité, led by Desmond Avery. At the time of writing, Rochelle was married to Michel, whose origins are not clearly stated, but we gather that he's also of Jewish descent, and together they have a son who is nine years old. Rochelle's coming to France is not discussed in the text, unlike Bernice, who relates at length how she left Guadeloupe behind her in search of a better life in Paris. Bernice was born in 1920, and so is older than Rochelle when she writes later in 1997 an autobiographical text, Paris, Souvenir Encombrant de la Guadeloupe. 
Bernice experienced a difficult family life with two marriages and nine children and now lives alone between La Courneuve and Guadeloupe. The two women are also linked through their work as cleaners. Lacking cultural and social capital, as articulated by Pierre Bourdieu, both women defy expectation and overcome obstacles to write the cité, and what they compose tells us much about contemporary French identity and society generally. Both women negotiate multiple identities and grapple with Frenchness. As Hall says in a British context, identities are not fixed, they are in flux. They are multiple. He gives us the example of third generation black British Caribbean young people and says, quote, third generation young black men and women know they come from the Caribbean, know that they are black, know that they are British. They want to speak from all three identities. They are all those identities together, end of quote. Here I would like to suggest that the notion of concurrent and multiple identities and the navigation of these competing and complementary affinities are very much relevant for the text I will discuss now, as we shall see firstly with Aya Rochelle. Rochelle's written creation of 1985 strongly contradicts the alleged discourse on the banlieue at the time. The obvious connection between Rochelle's text and French culture provides a strong contrast with stereotypes that categorize the council estates as external territories and their residents as menacing aliens. The series of short texts disseminated by Avery firstly reveals how Rochelle makes the decision to use the French language to compose a private chronicle about her life as a cleaner in La Courneuve. In doing so, she situates herself as part of, the of a community of language to use Etienne Balibar's terms, at the basis of the French nation. Therefore, while it may seem insignificant, Rochelle's adoption of French to compose her stories and describe her daily experience as an immigrant woman continuously reminds the reader that the banlieue and their inhabitants are not a part, but part of the French national community. Besides linguistic practices, Rochelle's texts also bear witness to the deep cultural knowledge of the author, which contradicts the common and recurrent accounts of the residents of the banlieue's inab inability to think, speak, or write. Even if it's true that not all the cité inhabitants possess the skills and abilities to express themselves equally well, Rochelle's sample productions break and short circuit the stereotypical depictions of the mute immigrant woman. Written in prose for the most part, Rochelle's texts, which reflect on exclusion, discrimination, and exile, tend to make her appear as a refined, bright, sophisticated, and knowledgeable individual. Another main interest of this text, composed in her daily free time, resides in the rich diversity that Rochelle, as a Franco-Tunisian woman of Jewish origin, presents. An indication of the double otherness experienced by immigrant women. These written works describe a subjective experience and quest for identity are typical of the new heterogeneity to be found in a French national community undergoing profound change. Strad straddling several identities, uh, Rochelle's entire ex exercise of text writing is highly revealing of the development in the 1980s of the new French diasporic cultures. Mostly rendered through a simple aesthetic of métissage, her multiple affinities translate a wide range of transnational links. They also express a cultural bond with the French nation and French identity, which appears more and more divided at that time. Quote, Our estate is nothing like those well-to-do neighborhoods. Life really exists. There is no need to use your imagination to know what, life, what life's like. I can see it when I'm on the, my way to the Vésiné. Life here isn't nice and kind like a picture. Instead, it's aggressive, cruel, with beans that smell, with shit, where cooking smells mingle from, other, from countries all over the world, the Caribbean, Mali, France, Arabia, Israel, Spain, Italy, and more besides. And that's something that I like. 
Overall, however, it is undoubtedly in their rendering of everyday culture that Rochelle's text best reminds the reader of the resemblance between suburban cultural practices and ways in France at large, thus breaking common assumptions of the cultural alterity of the banlieue. Multiple examples in Rochelle's text that immerse the reader in an ordinary existence on the margin, in fact displays habits and tastes in La Courneuve that are prevalent in society at large. Rochelle and her suburban counterparts are thus depicted as being interested in politics, which frightens them, as much as the concrete that surrounds them. As part of all the petites choses de la vie, she and her neighbors do their shopping at the local Viniprix, situated near the tower block. Making full use of the space outside the estate, Rochelle's job takes her to the affluent town of Le Vésiné, west of Paris. There she remarks that a certain internal sense of misery is also perceptible, despite the privileged status and living conditions of these other people from the banlieue. If some questions of cultural difference actually remain apparent in the text, Rochelle and the Cité inhabitants clearly share generic references and routines, reading, watching movies, or congregating with friends and relatives. The following lines succeed in capturing normal social rituals while underlining again the scarce resources within the housing project. Quote, the Maurice de Fontenay tower block, that's the meeting point for the locals. They meet, they chat. Sometimes women get together in groups of three or more. Children can be seen everywhere. Often they play with nothing and make up games. Last winter, a bit of snow fell. They were hanging around and skating on the icy lawn. End of quote. I'm going to move now to my second text, Paris Souvenir Encombrant de la Guadeloupe, by Thérèse Bernice. Bernice sought to escape uh, the harsh material conditions of life in the Caribbean and so left for Paris in 1951, only to confront poverty and racism in a new life there as a clean, cleaner living in La Courneuve. Her narrative is but one example of a passion for art and culture. Sorry. Okay. No, no, that's fine. Which also extends to acting and singing. Following on from this initial publication in 1997, her work was subsequently reissued in 2006, perhaps to coincide with the renewed interest in the banlieue in the aftermath of the riots. The text presents itself at first as a traditional récit de vie or life story, retracing the life of this strong, hardworking woman between the 1950s and 1990s who offered her services to wealthy individuals and companies. Filled with anecdotes, this account was adapted by Catherine Vigor, a Parisian secondary school teacher who has a long record of being a scribe for immigrants. Assisted by Vigor, Bernice's narrative is one of the great significance for her personally, as it links life, violence, and writing together. Quote, I don't want to die without having told the story of my struggles, my troubles, my battles faithfully." End of quote. This narrative demonstrates some of the most salient forms of discrimination and segregation, contradicting French Republican values, and in the process, illustrates the special status of the Antillais described by Edouard Glissant. One particular passage situated at the outset encapsulates the prevailing racial stigma in the 1950s and reminds us of Franz Fanon's fixation. Quote, send Mrs. Bernice in. And when they saw a black woman walk in, I could see how surprised they were. End of quote. Other excerpts suggest how difficult living conditions are for the newcomers in general and black women in particular. There was a, quote, old abandoned shack where I used to sleep, end of quote, indicates Paris. I gave them nearly all my pay. I hardly had anything left, end of quote. If many migrants with menial occupations like Bernice were forced to stay in temporary accommodation, 
The cleaners moved to a La Courneuve five bedroom flat in the 1960s, illustrates the social mobility and access to improve living conditions. It's quite remarkable how La Courneuve represented a safe haven for her and her children. The following lies surely exemplify a certain social promotion for Bernice, this in contrast with banlieue representations of the time. Quote, I was well off in my flat in La Courneuve. I'd got the inside all nice and cozy and had everything I needed. I did everything I, do, I could for my children. I had bought them a black and white telly and I remember that I didn't really know how it worked. End of quote. This chronicle of everyday life and forms of violence that afflicted the poorly educated Bernice is reminiscent of François Zegas' letter, Letters to a Black Woman, a text recounting Egas' personal experiences as a cleaner in the city of Marseille, which, has, has already which has already received some academic attention. Bernice's account and her whole writing project echoes the same themes while proving significantly different from Egas. What this dis distinguishes this multi-authored text stems from the cleaner's bypassing of conventional channels to tell a story using beautiful words, words that people like, words that have a nice musicality. The prologue explains in detail how the narrative which emerged from the collaboration between Vigor and my friend Thérèse Paris Bernice, who can't write, was made possible through long recorded discussions between the pair. The attention paid to the relationship between the cleaner and writing develops into a more complex narrative than a mere sociological account of the life of a woman cleaner. It also highlights the perseverance of the femme de ménage, beginning with Bernice's inhibitions in using the French language, to the influential role of her friend Yvonne, to the insertion of sev several self-authored songs, some of which deals explicitly with economic exploitation encountered by women cleaners, which leaves little time for reflection and therefore hinders creativity. Quote, before I didn't, really, I didn't really know if I was smart or not. I was constantly working day and night and didn't have the time to think about my own life. But when the day came and I was retired, I realized that if I had had an education, I could have done loads of things, for example, speak well and write beautiful lyrics to songs I would have sung." End of quote. In addition to charting a lived experience, Bernice's account offers reflective commentary on her coming to writing and, in the process, shows the contribution of the other parties involved, her friend Yvonne of the Grenelle Church, which helped her to write what she wanted to say and Vigor, who helped her to piece together the patchwork of her fragmented life to make a colorful cloth solidly woven. Whereas the text deals at length with the exploitation and men's violence, the help, friendship, and contribution of Bernice's female friends represent La Courneuve as another writing place and provides an illuminati illumin illuminating insight sorry, into the discovery of writing by a poor immigrant woman freed from her inhibitions. Quote, today, when I've got nothing to do, I write little things, bits of songs, even if it's just scribblings. I waste loads of paper before I'm satisfied and I haven't got time to be bored. On the contrary, it's like a lover who is pulling me towards them and compelling me to write. People who write are like me, on they? End of quote. All in all, the writing process of Paris' Souvenir Encombrant de la Guadeloupe is a painful one for Bernice. However, even if some may consider this text a bit of a borderline case of banlieue writing, it nevertheless shows how the least formally qualified writers can negotiate the multiple forms of identity and provides a woman's perspectives on the dominant discourses of banlieue and Frenchness. To conclude, I would like to go back to Hall again. He tells us that, and I quote, identity is always in the process of formation. 
identity is always constructed through ambivalence. All reminds us of the need to, and I quote again, address people through the multiple identities which they have, understanding that those identities do not remain the same, that they are frequently contradictory, that they cro cross cut one another. I would like to suggest that this whole tr holds true in the case of Rochelle and Bernice, and that their work has contributed to the circulation of original literary representations in La Courneuve. By way of a different approach to the banlieue, focusing as they do on everyday life and multiple identities, these female cleaners have contributed to bringing to the fore a new image of the reality of the city margins. Unlike dominant discourses, their productions have succeeded not only in dismantling some well-known cliches and assumptions about the 4000, but they have also unveiled a more complex and wide-ranging wide -ranging perspective on today's French identity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruno, for a nuanced and really detailed paper to start us off. Um, we're moving from the suburbs of Paris to Bradford. Um, with that, I'd like to welcome Claire Chambers, who is a senior lecturer in global literature at the University of York. Okay, you ready, Claire? Okay, so you see my title there, Birmingham, Nottingham, Bradford, British Pakistani novelist, depictions of Bradford. Um, just a brief but very warm thanks to Ma Malachi and Godler for the, the invitation, the great organisation. And just um, to quickly indicate the structure around which I'm going to talk today. Um, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of an introduction to Britain Through Muslim Eyes, the recent book that I wrote, Literary Representation 1780 to 1988 before going on to talk about Bradford and two writers in particular from that city and writing about it, who are Tarek Mahmood and M.Y. Alam. And then try, if there's time, to, to come to some kind of conclusion. So my project that I've been working on for, I think, 12 years now, um, it was I was trying to do a literary history of um, literary representations of and by Muslims in Britain from the beginning till now and I thought in my innocence that I could pack all this into a single book and when I got to the November before um, early January deadline I was only in the 1950s and I had about 80,000 words so I had to ring the publisher and pitch a two book project to them which they luckily went for so that's why I cut off my book at 1988. So the, the book I'm working on now starts in 1988, starts with the satanic verses and the controversy that followed and, and brings it right up to date. So it's this kind of work, this new research that I'm talking about today. But uh, just going back to the book I, I published um, in 2015, Britain Through Muslim Eyes, because I think it is relevant. What I found, it, as I found more and more historical writing um, from 1780, um, Mirza Sheikh Itzamuddin's The Wonders of Ilayat, um, lots of travel writing memoirs of the late 18th, early 19th century onwards, um, right up to the modernists of the interwar period, um, up, to, up to the early 80s. What I found was um, that there was a change uh, in the post-Second World War period, which was that um, the cla social class of the writers started to change with mass migration. Um, and in the book I call this uh, a transition from England returned to the myth of return. Um, so England returned is a term used in much of South Asia to refer to people who've been educated all over the UK, not necessarily just in England, but England comes to stand in for the whole of the UK. Um, and the expression is used by Shumita Mukherjee to describe South Asian students in Britain in her excellent work of history, Nationalism, Education and Migrant Identities, The England Return, and that was from 2011. However, I'm probably the first person to examine this social class's literary output. 
So this is a high class, um, in, my, in my work I found pr actual princes and many aristocrats and students. Um, the early period people were, you know, had a lot of cultural and social capital and um, they tended to return. Even if it was after 10 or 15 years, they came to Britain mostly for, often for educational purposes and eventually went back often to become very powerful and well recognised in their own countries. And then from, especially from the 60s onwards, um, you have the myth of return class um, who do not go back. They, they think they will, but because they haven't got the means and because they start to put down roots, um, have families and so forth, um, it, you know, Mohammed Anwar in, in 1974 termed this the myth of return. Um, so, as well, there is a shift in the period away from, it's very much a London-centric literature in the, the um, early period. Um, London, Oxford and Cambridge are the, are the places where these um, early writers mostly go to, and they might tour around, but, these, but the, the metropole is, is where they tend to um, stay and have the most to say about. But this alters towards the end of the period, from the 60s onwards, and I'm looking in this paper to move from the 80s onwards, from the capital to the provincial cities of Birmingham, Bradford, Leeds and Manchester, and, and of course today I'm focusing specifically on Bradford. And this is what James Proctor calls provincialising London, or very importantly, devolutionary writing, which um, Corin Fowler has done a lot of really good work on as well. The shift to the northern cities is due to their industries, textiles, steel and vehicle manufacture, ma manufacturing. And, and in the post-war period, these had a labour shortage that South Asian Muslim migrants filled. The devolutionary trend accelerates in the post rushdie period, um, with other countries of Britain, particularly Scotland, featuring ever more prominently in this literature. My thesis is that uh, towards the end of the designated period, 1780 to 1988, authors are beginning, not, as I've mentioned, not to return to their countries anymore and are increasingly from the more proletarian myth, myth of return class. By the mid to the late 20th century, South Asian Muslim migration was characterised by chain migration in which a group of Asian um, of pioneer migrants came to Britain and subsequently sponsored relatives and friends to come. They retained village kin networks, known as baradari, and strong links to the home country. Working class South Asian Muslim settlers in the post-war period saw themselves as transients. As I say, they thought they would return, but this became a myth as time went on. In her unfinished novel about Britain, called No New Lands, No New Seas, Atiyah Hussain describes the working class characters arrival in Britain as follows. So this is the, um, the quotations on the slide for you. Monet had arrived in London with two pounds and a friend's address. When he got there, his friend had long left for some distant northern place. Birmingham, Nottingham, Bradford. The stout, suspicious Punjabi woman who had answered his knock recited the words as she kept the front door half shut, telling him she knew nothing, would have to ask her husband who was at work and would not return for another two hours. She then shut the door. So this quotation obviously um, recalls the two, sort of two or so pounds in the pocket story that's often told by members of the first generation of migrants to come to Britain. Hussein also makes her character articulate the outsiders and metropol me metropolitan characters' comical view of the north of England. In this paper, I'm interested in, quote-unquote, Bradford, that provincial West Yorkshire city that, as the Punjabi woman's mispronunciation suggests, has been transformed by South Asian Muslim migration. And for your information, this Brad in Bradford signifies baradari, which I mentioned before. These are the kinship networks that are so strong in the city and in Mirpuri culture more broadly, while the suffix gown in Birmingham and Nottingham means village. The first novel under scrutiny is from the early 1980s. It's one of the first examples of fiction coming from the myth of return class outside of London, and it's a, a little-known Anglophone text entitled Hand on the Sun, 1983, by British Pakistani writer Tariq Mahmood. The other three novels that I'm interested in, are um, they come from a 
what I'm calling a Bradford Noir trilogy by writer M.Y. Allen, who's also a sociologist at the University of Bradford. Um, and these, the titles are Annie Potts is Dead from 1999, Kilo from 2005, and Red Lull from, I think, 2012. Yeah, 2012. Um, and in his two post-9-11 novels, Annie, um, Kilo and Red Lull, Alam is interested in what, ha what has happened, and I quote, since Tommy Taliban and Betty Burka had taken centre stage, unquote. All these works of fiction explore the Biradari or kinship system that is evoked by Hussein in her neologism, Bradford. And they also specifically focus on Bradford's predominantly Mirpuri community from the Azad Kashmir region of North East Pakistan. I argue that whereas Hussein, Atiyah Hussein, is from an aristocratic background, what we might call the England returned cosmopolitan class, even though Hussein didn't return to South Asia, but she shares links with um, many of those who did, like Kurat and Haida, who did return. She's from that aristocratic class. Um, so Hussein looks at Northern England very much from the outside. It, it's, a, it's a brilliant um, fragment that we have. It's an unfinished no novel. Um, but she, she is uh, talking about London, and she doesn't know the North, as we see from the quote I just read. Um, but the later novelists, Mahmoud and Alam, are from this myth of return class, and they portray Bradford's ghettoized deprivation from the inside. Most of Britain's, and especially Bradford's and Birmingham's, Pakistani communities are specifically from Mirpur, which I've referenced a few times. So just a quick um, indication of what this is, if you're not sure. In the early 1960s, the huge Mangala Dam was constructed in the Azad Kashmir. Azad means free. So this was the sm smaller and less beautiful part of Kashmir that Pakistan held on to. India got two-thirds, the most beautiful and strategic part. Um, Pakistan got the kind of crappy bit, and they've been fighting ever since. Um, and then um, this Mangla Dam project was built in um, late 50s, early 60s, which led to the flooding of several hundred villages in Mirpur district and the displacement of over 100,000 people. The contemporaneous demand for menial labour in Britain's textiles industry, coupled with the relative ease of movement prior to the Commonwealth Immigrants Act of 1962, facilitated the migration of thousands of Kashmiris to Yorkshire, Birmingham, Greater Manchester and other regions. Both Mahmoud and Alam explore the problems faced by second generation Pakistanis or Kashmiris in Bradford. I consider Hand on the Sun to be the first published novel by a South Asian Muslim that dealt almost exclusively with Muslims in Britain and was written in English. Hand on the Sun is set in the recent past, in this case in 1976. This was the year a Sikh man, Gurdip Singh Chugga, was killed in a racist m murder, which was followed by, quote, a youth explosion on the streets of South Hall, end quote. That's a quote from Mehmood himself. This was also when the battle for Bradford took place. In this incident, as Sean McLaughlin explains, the National Front, having organised a large anti-immigration march through the city, were eventually chased out of town by an angry crowd of West Indian and Asian youth. Hand on the Sun is explicitly set against this backdrop of the these two events, and slogans like Long Live Southall and Southall Fights provide inspiration to the Bradford activists. The later context of the early 1980s, sus laws, Thatcherism, unemployment, and the 1981 race riots also informed the work, even though it's set retrospectively in the late 70s. Mehmood's short novel is full of realist detail about the lives of legal and illegal Pakistani and Bengali migrants. Of course, it's one. Oh no, this is soon after um, the second partition of the subcontinent when. Um, East Pakistan became Bangladesh in 1971. Um, but this, you know, there's still a closeness there and a sort of hatred as there is with India. So these uh, migrants are surreptitiously eking out a living in urban Britain. Hand and the Sun is written in a less elusive and international and more direct and local form than text by the England return writers like Hussein. 
There was greater emphasis on external detail about food, clothes and daily routines and not as much interest in the interior lives of characters. Mahmoud employs a precise, sparse style that is also almost akin to the discourse of social history. Um, Mahmoud is well known in Yorkshire and beyond for having been one of the Bradford Twelve. This was a group of Asian men that also included uh, the very famous Tariq Ali. And they worked for the United Black Youth League, um, so they were anti-racist movement. And they were acquitted of using explosives in 1981 against violent racists in the area. So they were, they were found to have been making Molotov cocktails and brought to court and defended themselves. And, and were let off because they, they were able to prove that the racism in the city was so bad that they had this for self-defence. Mahmoud is also a fervent pr promoter of the Mirpuri language Potawari and writing children's books in that language. His novella's epigraph is the El Salvadorian graffiti, to hold a people down forever is like putting a hand on the sun. Hand on the sun then, like um, Alam's later fiction, is a politically activist book from a working class writer. From the 1990s onwards, writers from British Muslim backgrounds started branching out from literary fiction and subverting popular genres conventions. I examine the ways in which M.Y. Alam is engaged in the genre bending of popular fiction. In his South Asian Muslim noir of the late 1990s onwards, M.Y. Alam's Bradford based novel, Annie Potts is Dead, centres on a crime, the murder of the eponymous old lady Annie Potts. There are false leads that point suspicion at our hero, Amy, who's a corner shop worker and writer, and the novel traces his eventual escape. All of this unfolds in Bradford, with only a few sections set in Amy's ancestral ho homeland of Pakistan. Alan went on to write Kilo, another novel set in Bradford, but dealing in more detail with the British Asian drug dealing underworld. And Red Lyle's about the same character of Kilo, whose real name is Khalil Khan, who's trying to leave his drug dealing past behind him. Alam's fiction, I argue, may be viewed as examples of Muslim crime fiction, specifically the hard boiled or noir subgenre, giving their gritty renditions of the mean streets of Bradford and of an unnamed Pakistani town, and also given their spare, wisecracking style. Alam appropriates and challenges some of crime fiction's conventions in order to challenge its assumption of a good and evil dichotomy, and its unspoken complicity with colonial or neo-colonial law enforcement institutions. Despite, or perhaps because of the earlier rather orientalist attempts by British writers to represent the Indian subcontinent in crime fiction, there had been um, quite a lot of writers, of crime writers, who were interested in the exoticism of India. But Alam rejects the conventions of the classic or whodunit subgenre, creating instead critical reworkings of the hard boiled detective genre, the American tradition, which is at the time was quite unusual in the late 90s. Now there's actually a really strong tradition coming out of Pakistan with writers like Omar Shaheed Hamid um, and M.M. Um, Morsouf, or no, sorry, S.S. Morsouf. There's like this Pakistani crime fiction, but to my knowledge, um, M.Y. Alam was there quite a long time before I'm doing it in a British diasporic context. Whereas earlier texts by such England returned South Asian Muslim writers as Atiyah Hussain, Sajid Zahir, and Karathal and Haider had a cosmopolitan, interracial, and interreligious feel, Mahmoud and Alam almost exclusively portray Muslim characters. They also produce very masculine texts, although both writers make at least some attempt to address women's issues. This masculine masculinist term reflects the demographic makeup of the first generation of South Asian permanent migrants, um, the working class members of which tend to be Muslim and male. The men usually brought their wives and children over only after they'd spent many time, many years in Britain. Like many of the earlier writers, Mehmood put some, some emphasis on education, but whereas authors like Zahir and Haida explore university life, his interest is in a broken comprehensive school segregated on racial lines. Most of the central characters in Hand on the Sun came to Britain when they were very young or were British born and they experienced a shocking level of racism and neglect at this school in Bradford. 
The protagonist, Jalib's headmaster, tells him, quote, you are no longer in a jungle. This is a civilised country. And white kids band together to beat up young Pakistanis. Mahmoud also writes of local Asian children who were bussed away from the area to other schools because of the policy of the local council. As Marie Macy explains, in the 1960s and 70s, the official purpose of busing was to try to avoid schools in areas of high Pakistani settlement being unable to cope with large numbers of children who had no access to English. So it's a very controversial policy. And unsurprisingly, local Asians viewed this as discriminatory practice and protested against it. But these novels really mark a transition from earlier writings interest in student flannery into a concern with the world of work. There is greater cross-cultural, even cross-religious solidarity in Hand on the Sun, though, probably because of its emphasis on left-wing activism. A Sikh character, Dalia Singh, tells Jalib that South Asians must draw on their rich culture and history to defeat neo-imperialism. Dalia Singh conjures up images of the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, um, whose anniversary we're coming up to, um, it was 1919, so um, two, year, two more years till 100 years of that terrible massacre in Amritsar. And, he, and this is used to conjure up unity. Significantly, he praises Udham Singh, the Indian who killed the massacre's ringleader, General Odaya, in London in 1940, for signing his name, Ram Muhammad Singh, in an expression of South Asian symbolic unity. So I know that I'm nearly out of time, and I'm sorry about that, but let's skip to um, let's skip to the quotation I wanted to show you which is from um, Red Lal um, this is where Baradari which I was talking about early on about the kinship networks is portrayed as a kind of old boys network so a man says to the character Kilo in Red Lal you are Ayab's son and then the quote follows he says Never favoured the... Uh, in fact, this is, this is Kilo's thoughts, right? After, after the man has said to him, oh, you're, you're Ayub's son, so he's going to get special treatment because he is, you know, they, the man knows his father. But he thinks to himself, never favoured the old Biradari name-dropping game, never really followed the point of it or saw its essence. He knew my old man, and so what? Didn't mean a thing. As he stood there, eyes pleading, I believed it would never would. Um, oh gosh, <laughs> I'm just going to do quotes now. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a quote from Annie Potts, again by M. Wallet Allen, and it shows the indebtedness to the hard-boiled children that I've been talking about. And this is the novel's very first sentences that signal this. He says, the character is, is this free and direct discourse. The second best thing I ever did was coming here. This idea of return that I dreamt about for so long simply had to be fulfilled. I was given all those warnings, but didn't really believe any of them about the food, the climate, the people, and of course, a typo, a triple dose of a thug named culture shop would leap out from some shit-filled alley and begin to kick my head in. So this is about the character returning to Pakistan. So the myth becomes a reality at this point in um, Annie Potts is dead. He, he has gone back to Pakistan. And, and so it evokes this idea of, of return. The final discussion of a vis viciously personified culture shock is perhaps the most evidently noir-like section of the passage. When Alam describes culture shock as leaping out from some shit-filled alley, one cannot but think of Raymond Chandler, American hard-boiled novelist, approving assessment of his forebear, Dashiell Hammett's noir writing, of the um, of crime fiction. So this is the final quote. And this is Raymond Chandler says Dashiell Hammett took murder out of the Venetian bars and dropped it into the alley. From the outset, then, Alam doffs his hat to his hard-boiled antecedents, but his new approach is signalled in the very different location of the mean streets described. So um, he's talking about the mean streets of Bradford and Pakistan rather than urban America. And in Alam's positioning of his hero as a victim, being metaphorically leapt out of and actually arrested. This is the polar opposite of Chandler's virile masculinist description of Hammett actively dropping the metaphorical gaze bars, and more broadly, of noir 
detectives as usually being in control of situations. Accordingly, Alam represents the police in post thatcherite pre-Northern riots Britain of the late 1990s as corrupt and racially prejudiced. So I just want to conclude by suggesting that noir pr proves a highly successful form for reflecting the experiences of post-colonial or migrant subjects. Alam and, and uh, Mahmoud depict crime from the point of view of the interrogated, incarcerated, runaway Muslim male in Islamophobic and racist Britain. Thank you.